And now here's what I need you to do. I need you to open up your heart. We said that a moment ago. Prepare yourselves. Hopefully loosen up your hand. Get ready to write some stuff. It's going to be a great night. Will you do me a favor? Will you welcome our friend, Dr. Chip Bennett, as he comes, everybody? It's going to be a great night. You doing well? All right. Are you ready to learn something? Okay, so we're going to be sort of like... We're gonna try, I'm going to try to bridge the gap between a college class and a, um, a church Bible study. Um, I'll let you all tell me how well I do um, after I'm on my way in my car back to Sarasota. Just kidding. But, uh, <clears throat> but let's, let, let's, let's get to work here. Um, I, I do want to say one thing. I am uh, always pleased as, as an academic and who also is a pastor. I'm, I'm, also, I'm always pleased when a church takes time to do something like this. And I want to thank your pastors, Jason and Liz, for having a heart to not just love the Lord, you know, with our hearts and with our souls, but to also love the Lord with our mind. And, uh, and so that's what we're going to do here. And I think you ought to thank them for allowing something like this to happen because this doesn't happen at, at, every, at every church in, in, in America. So I've got a goal. Um, I'll let you all tell me at the end. Um, how well we did. I, I want to give you some tools this evening to help you better understand and read your Bible. Um, this is not going to be exhaustive. Um, I don't have time to be exhaustive. I've tried to pick some things that I think will help you in your reading of Scripture. One of the problems that we have um, is, is a church, um, in, in my opinion, it, it, when reading Scripture is, and it's, there's nothing wrong with, with what we do. Please hear me here. Not, definitely not being snarky or trying to give everybody a hard time. Um, but we've learned to read devotionally. And, and by reading devotionally, what we do is we sometimes don't realize what's going on in the larger context of a book, nor do we understand what's maybe largely going on in the narrative of the whole biblical story. Nothing wrong if you read devotionally. I would rather you read devotionally than not read at all. But I want to give you some tools that I think will help you to understand what you're doing better. So to start off, <clears throat> if you ever worked a puzzle... Anybody ever worked a puzzle? Okay, are you like me? I, I'd be shocked if you're not like me. That when you get the puzzle, you take all the pieces out, you turn them over, and then you put the top of the box right there so you know what you're trying to build, right? Does anybody just take the top of the box and put it in the closet and then just try to put stuff together? Maybe, maybe you're adventurous and you do that. I think most of us realize having the top of the box makes the pieces make sense. So when we're reading scripture, one of the first things that we need to know is that to understand the pieces, we have to understand the whole. So, so, so when you're reading a passage and, and you may quote, you may have passages that you love, <clears throat> that you quote regularly. The, the question is, is that passage saying what you think it's saying? Is it within the larger context flowing with the way that you're saying? Does it flow within the entire book that's being written? So to understand the bits, we have to understand the pieces. And what I want to do here is I've got a couple of quick things to go through that, that I think will help you. So if you can open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. If you have a phone, you can pull a Bible up like I'm going to do here, and you can turn right to Ephesians 1. <clears throat> no problem at all. Easy to do it. Um, it. Paul and the apostles would have loved to have had iPhones, um, but they didn't have them. Um, when I first started school, um, it'll date myself because I'm 52, um, I, I had a typewriter. Some of y'all may not believe this. That's what I worked on. Um, then the typewriters came with these correction tapes. So before you had that, if you made a mistake in the middle of your paper, you had to pull it and you had to start again. It was very frustrating. Okay, when the ribbon came out that you could correct when you made a mistake, it was like the day of Pentecost happened in my dorm room. I mean, it was, it was incredible. And then computers came along and everything's great. But I remember back in the day where <clears throat> I had to go to a Bible or a Greek text and open it up and go through line by line and look at the words and pick stuff out. And now you can just type it in on a computer and it shows you everything. It's incredible. So let me just say this to you. There is no reason for any American to be illiterate with the Bible. There are so many tools for us to avail ourselves with. So, so just know that. But we got to look at the, the, the pieces. So I'm going to just read you some passages here 
as we go through the book of Ephesians, and I want you to tell me what you think, whether, you, whether you've read Ephesians or not, <clears throat> whether you think you know what Ephesians is talking about, I want you to just listen to, as I read this, and then you tell me what you think this book might possibly be about. So chapter 1, verse 22, let me read that to you. Paul says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor. No, that's, hold on, I'm in Philippians, my bad. Let me, t- let me, let me go here. Hold on, Chip, what are you doing here? Okay, Ephesians, here we go. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, there we go, 122. It's like, I know that's not right. So he says, and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 10. It says in verse 3, or chapter 10, or chapter 3, verse 10, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Let's go to 321. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Go with me to 523. 523 says, <clears throat> For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Verse 24, as the church submits to Christ. Verse 25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. I'm not even going to add some of the other words like and he gave himself for her, which would still be the church. We're just going to use the words ecclesia that's here. It says here that he, in verse 27, that he might present the church to himself. In verse 29, it says, just as Christ does the church. In 532, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Now, with that much of a word being used in the epistle, you, you, you should be able to realize that Paul is talking a lot about the church. Why is that important? Because <clears throat> if you're going to read Ephesians, you have to know he's talking about the church. In chapter 4, he talks about the people that he's placed in the church to equip the saints, the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, to equip the saints, to build the church, to, to look like the full statue of Christ. He's writing about the church. He's writing to a group of people in Ephesus that have competing religious stories. And he's trying to write to Ephesus, telling them they need to be the church in their community. And he tells them why that's so important. He says, because in chapter one, he says, God is going to fill the entire world with his glory through the church. In fact, in chapter three, he's going to show his wisdom, his manifold wisdom and grace through the church, even to the principalities and powers. He set people in the church to equip the church. In chapter 4, marriage is, 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 is a sort of a, 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 a microcosm or sort of an analogy to, to the church. Why is all that important? Because he's wanting them to live a life that looks like Jesus in Ephesus, which is why when we come to chapter 5, and if you will, turn to chapter 5 in the book of Ephesians <clears throat> and get ready to have a moment here. He says to them in verse 18, he says he doesn't want them getting drunk with wine. He wants them filled with the Spirit. This is the church. He wants them to be filled with the Spirit of God, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Key verse. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What Paul then does is Paul takes the Roman household code, which was codified in Rome. It was the Pax Romana. It was the peace of Rome. And in the, in the, in, in the Roman understanding of the household, man ruled. Everything else was basically insignificant. Kids were chattel. Slaves were chattel. The wife was just a wife <clears throat> to produce children, but men sort of ran everything. Paul says we're called to be something different. We're called to be the church. God ordained the church in chapter 1. He predestined the church in chapter 1 to fill the earth with his glory. And and the church is now constituted of 
both Jew and Gentile in chapter 2. He says the two have become one new entity, and that is the church, so that through the church, the principalities and powers will understand about who he is. He's put people in the church to equip the church. So here's what the church should look like in Ephesus to make it a countercultural entity to what people have normally seen. We submit one to another out of reverence for Christ. How do we do that? Well, he tells us. He tells us how men and women both submit to one another. He tells us how fathers and sons both submit one to another. And he tells us how slaves and masters submit one to another. He shows us what that looks like in the household code. By the way, in verse 22, where it says, wives submit to your husbands, the word submit is not in the Greek. It doesn't appear there. It's pulled in from verse 21. It's pulled in because it just says wives to your husbands. So the translators say wives submit because okay, the wives do submit. The husbands submit in reference to Christ by loving their wives as Christ loved the church. Sons submit to their fathers by understanding that when you honor your father and mother, that's the first commandment with promise. But fathers submit to their children by not provoking their children to anger. And slaves and masters turning the whole thing upside down, they work together because they are brothers in Christ. Which is why in chapter 6, and flip there, if you will, <clears throat> in verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I want you to be the church, Paul is saying. I've, I've told you everything about the church. I've told you, you you need to look differently than the rest of the world. You need to act differently. Your household needs to reflect who Jesus is. You need to be different. And he says, so you're going to have to be strong in the Lord. You're going to need to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to fight. No, to stand. Never told to fight. The battle's been won by Jesus. We stand in the victory. He says, stand against the schemes of the devil, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Who's the flesh and blood? It's husband and wives, children and fathers, slaves and masters. That's who the flesh and blood are that you're wrestling against in Ephesus. You're struggling in the household to give forth the church in a positive way in Ephesus. And he says, so stand firm because you're not wrestling against those people, there is a cosmic battle trying to keep you from being what God needs you to be in Ephesus. And so when you read Ephesians, you have to read it within the whole. You can't just grab passages and tell people, Bible bullet, Bible bullet, Bible bullet. You have to say, hold on, there's a larger thing going on here in the book of Ephesians. So let's, let's do the same thing with the book of Philippians. Flip to the book of Philippians, which is where I was at at the very beginning. Um, I knew I was getting there at some point. <clears throat> so I want to read this to you. Chapter 1, verse 5. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for your partakers of me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Isn't that interesting? Paul is in prison, and he says that his imprisonment has actually served to advance the gospel. Paul's not even concerned that he's thrown in prison. He's more concerned with the advancement of the gospel. Are we? He goes on, verse 16. He says, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. Verse 27. He says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. 2.22. Flip there. What does he say? He says, You know Timothy's proven worth as a son with a father. He served me with me in the gospel. Chapter 4, verse 3. says, I ask you, true companion, help these women who've labored side by side with me in the gospel. Chapter 4, verse 15. He says, and you Philippians yourselves know that at the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, what's Philippians about? Well, it's about the gospel. It's about what does it mean 
to preach the gospel? What does it mean to live the life of the gospel? And the book is written because there is a little problem going on in the church at Philippi. Paul's in prison, either in Ephesus or Rome. We don't know and scholars debate where he was at, but he was in prison. He's got a problem. He's got two women in chapter four named Euodia and Syntyche who are arguing in the church. And so what he does is he says, hey, I'm in prison, no big deal. I'm in prison because the gospel is going. In other words, it's more important what God is doing through me than me getting what I want. And in fact, he says, it, when, when you're living a life like that, it will show your adversaries that you actually are a follower of God because you live a life different than, than them. And then he says, oh, and by the way, if you've participated in the spirit, if you've really come to know the Lord, he says, I want you to have the same mind in the church amongst yourselves that Jesus had. Jesus, who was equal with God, didn't cling to that. He gave that up and became a servant. Key word here, servant. And then he goes to give you three men who exemplify that. Himself, which I don't think he intended to include because I don't think Paul was trying to write about himself, but he says, if I'm being offered up as a sacrifice for your faith, no big deal. Then he says, oh, and by the way, not only is that, but I've got a guy named Timothy. Go to chapter two. I want, you to, I want this to settle in because he's getting to these women that are fighting. I want you to hear what he says in verse 19. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I may be cheered by news of you. Listen, verse 20. I have no one like him. I have a lot of preachers. I have a lot of people that I could send to you but I don't have anybody like Timothy. I got, a lot of, I got a lot of men that I could send that could teach you scripture, that could lead you in prayer, but I've only got one Timothy who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests. These are his preachers. He goes, I ain't got a preacher that I could send to you that really would care for you. They're more concerned about themselves. And then he says, let me tell you about my buddy Epaphroditus. In verse 25, he says, I think it's necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need for he's been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Listen, he was bothered because the Philippians had heard he was ill. He didn't want them to be concerned with the fact that he was ill because he was so concerned about them, not himself. And Paul says, honor such men. He says, oh, in chapter three, by the way, he goes, all the things that I had that, you know, I mean, I was all this and all that and all this, I, I've counted it all as loss. Because what I really want to know is I want to know Christ. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. In America, we want to know him in the power of his resurrection. We surely don't know, want to know him in the power of his, in, uh, in, in his sufferings. We don't, want to, we don't want to have anything to do with sufferings. Paul says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings, if by any means I might be conformed to the image of his death. Then in chapter four, he hits it home. He says, verse two, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche, agree in the Lord, put it away. Whatever it is that you're arguing over, it's not important. The gospel is what is important. Listen to me. All this garbage we argue about in the church, all this stuff we argue about is costing us in America because the gospel is the only thing that can save people. And we argue about the dumbest stuff. It ain't, listen, if every one of you believed everything I believe about every philosophical, political, moral, ethical stuff. Can I tell you something? Not one more person would be going to the kingdom of heaven. Because the only person that can get us into heaven is Jesus. And when we compromise the gospel because we argue about stupid stuff, 
what we do is we hurt the church. Paul says, I need these two women. Listen to what he says about them. He says, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel. If you don't think women can be in ministry, you're gonna have to talk to Paul because Paul said they were co-laborers with him. Okay, they worked with him. They were on the equal platform with him. He says, but I need them to agree. Stop fighting. And that's, and that's what he's in this epistle, he's writing about the gospel and he's saying the true gospel person is more concerned about others and about them understanding who Jesus is rather than getting their own way. And I got a lot of preachers, Paul would say, that are really concerned about their own self and their agendas and their stuff and their stances and their soapboxes. But I got one Timothy who actually will be concerned for you. And I need you, Odia, and I need Sintiki to get it together and to stop arguing in the church. Let me tell you something. Gossip, what ranging, rag, raggling around with your tongues, talking about junk that you don't know about, I'm telling you, you don't help the cause of God at all in any way, shape, or form. The best thing we can do is stay on point and remember that there is one name given among men whereby they can be saved, and his name is Jesus. Okay, let's continue on. Book of Revelation, I'm gonna tell you a story. See here if you can, if you can follow along. You don't need to go to the book of Revelation. Um, my favorite Revelation quote is by Mark Twain. He says, the book of Revelation is just one darn thing after the other. <laughs> but I want to tell you a story so you can understand how the whole works. <clears throat> so I want you to see if you recognize this story. There is a man who encounters the Lord. And the Lord has a sword, a, a sword, a sword drawn. And he falls at his feet. And the Lord says to him that he needs to prepare the people for holy war because there's a city that's walled up to God that they're going to take. And he sends two spies into that city to see what's going on. And in that city, there is a prostitute. There is a whore. Her name is Rahab. But Rahab is a believer. By the way, she's a prostitute. She's a believer. Let me say that again. She's a believer that the Lord is after who is a prostitute in the town. She has the power of death over the two spies. She hides them. They come down out. They go back out. The children of Israel walk around Jericho seven days. On the seventh day, they walk around seven times. At the sound of the trumpet, the walls fall. But before they can go in and destroy the city, Rahab has to be delivered and her family from Jericho. And Rahab marries Salmon, who is in the righteous line of Judah. And so the whore of Jericho becomes a royal bride. Okay, so let me ask you a question. When you read Revelation and John falls at Jesus' feet in chapter 1, because Jesus has a sword not drawn as the commander of the Lord's host in Joshua 5, but the sword comes out of his mouth because it's the word of God. He says, I need you to write to seven churches. I need you to get them right. He said, because there's actually a city that in that city there's a whore and there are seven cycles that continue to telescope out until the seven trumpets are blown and on the seventh trumpet, all the walls of the city fall and the words are heard, come out from her, my people. And the people who come out are the ones that join Christ as his bride at the marriage supper of the lamb. See, the background of Revelation is the story of Joshua. That's how you understand that book. And by the way, if you wanna know what the city is in Revelation, if you wanna know, it tells you very clearly what the city is. That would be found in Revelation eleven eight. You can go there and read. It says it's spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. It's the city where our Lord was crucified. 
the city that's to be destroyed in Revelation is the city of Jerusalem. And it was destroyed in 70 AD. To understand that book, you have to understand the top of the box. You have to understand what's going on. So again, I'm not gonna be able to tell you everything about these books, but I think you should at least go, wow, you know, to understand. So I tell all my students this. This is what I tell them on a regular basis. If you can't tell me the book from the beginning to the end, and you can't recite me the book from the beginning to the end, you don't know the book. You may think you know the book, but you don't know the book. Unless you can tell me what Paul is doing in chapter one of Romans all the way through chapter 16, you don't know the book. If you can't tell me what's going on in Galatians one through Galatians six, you don't know the book. If you don't know what's going on in Hebrews one through Hebrews 13, you don't know the book. If you don't know what's going on in Matthew one through Matthew chapter 28, you don't know the book. Because to understand what's going on in the particulars, you have to understand the entire book. So that means we've got a lot of work to do because we've got to start reading these things in one setting, which is like totally foreign to us where we read like a couple of passages of scripture and, and then go to bed. Like you have to sit down and read. Like when I read the book of Romans, I read the book of Romans. I, I, don't, I don't read a chapter. I read the whole thing through. And it's not, it doesn't take that long. It's not as long as you think. And I can tell you this, I'm not trying to be snarky, but I can tell you this, a lot of y'all can sit around and watch hours of TV. I guarantee you can find some time, spend a little time in the word of God. That's all I'm gonna say. Okay, <clears throat> let's, pay, let's do the second thing here. So far, are you following me? Good? Yeah. You enjoying this? Yes, you sure? Yes. You mean get in my car and leave right now? Okay, okay. Okay. Um, second big idea here is we gotta pay attention to what I told you earlier today the watermarks, because they're, they're huge in Scripture. There's sort of this understanding that you know the story. So when you read Matthew, Matthew tells us that Jesus is in this royal lineage. He tells us that when Jesus is a young boy, that the Magi come to visit Jesus. But Jesus, there's a Herod that wants to kill Jesus, and, and, and he kills all the kids two years and younger. Jesus has to flee to Egypt. Then he comes back from Egypt to Israel. When he comes back to Israel, he goes through the waters of the Jordan. And when he comes through the waters of the Jordan, he then goes into the wilderness. And when he comes out of the wilderness, he goes up onto the mountain and gives the Sermon on the Mount. That, that is a retelling. Historically, it's what happened with Jesus. But it's a retelling of a new Moses. Moses, when he was a kid, Pharaoh was trying to kill the kids. He had to leave Egypt, remember? He went to Midian. Then, then he came back to Egypt. And when he came back, what happened? He delivered the children of Israel through the Red Sea. Then he went into the wilderness. And then he went up on Mount Sinai and gave the law. What Matthew is telling us with Jesus' life is that Jesus is the new Moses. In fact, what he's telling us is Jesus is the new Israel. Because he says, out of Egypt I've called my son. All Jewish people would have understood that to have been Israel but it's now Jesus. Jesus has taken on. That's why he reconstitutes the 12 tribes around himself with the 12 disciples. And when he goes up on the mountain, he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you, who in their right mind could say what God told you in the Old Testament, I'm now gonna tell you what you really need to hear other than God himself. So see, these, these texts are assuming that you know some of these stories. They're watermarks. We talked about Mark 4 today, the story of Jonah in, 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 this, in, in Mark 4. And I just included that in there because I, I thought you might remember that from this morning. Acts 12 is another story that tells us inc an incredible watermark. Turn to Acts 12, prepared to get like, whoa, man, this is crazy. You're going you're gonna <clears> to <throat> really enjoy this, I think. Usually when I do this, people are like, man, this is the coolest thing in the world. This is a great, this is a great, this is a good story. You're, you'll enjoy this. So about that time, Herod, and not the same Herod that was 
back in the Gospels. Different Herod, same name. That's important. We told you that today. Names matter. He laid hands on some who belonged to the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Hold on. Was there another Herod that killed somebody with a sword? Yeah, John. Yeah, so, so you can see. That there, it's, it's recalling. It's like you should be, yeah, hold on. This is a different story, but hold on. There's some stuff going on here. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter. <clears throat> this was during the days of unleavened bread. Why does he say that? He doesn't have to tell you that. He doesn't have to tell you that it's the feast of Passover at all. What happened during the, fe the, the, the feast of Passover? What, 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 why does he tell us that? It says, when he seized him and put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers. Was there anybody else that was guarded by four squads, squads of soldiers? At the tomb? Yeah. Jesus was guarded by four squads of soldiers. Why is he telling us this? Why are those words there? Why is he telling us this story? Guarding him, intending after Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, <clears throat> but earnest prayer was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. He was chained to two soldiers and he was sleeping. Why does he tell us that? Because he's wanting you to hear something. He's wanting you to see something. He's chained sleeping. Let's continue on. Behold, the angel of the Lord, and, and, and so that you know, prison was in the ground in the first century. So he's in the abode of Hades. He's in the abode of death. He's dug in the ground. He's in prison in between two soldiers. He's naked, by the way. We'll see that in a minute because he's told to put his clothes on. And he's sleeping. And an angel appears in this prison cell and a light shown in the cell. He struck Peter on the side. Why in the world would he do such a thing? And he woke up. And this is where our translators just have a really terrible, bad literary imagination. The Greek word is not get up quickly. The Greek word is rise. And the chains fell off his hands. The angel said, get your clothes on, put on your sandals. And when he did, he went out. Now, verse 12, <laughs> where did he go? Well, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where they were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door, a servant girl named Rhoda came and said, she recognized Peter's voice and she didn't open up the gate. She ran in and said, Peter's here. And they said, you're out of your mind. There's no way he's here. Can't be him. But she kept insisting while well, he continued to knock. Finally, he went in. And then he says in, in verse 17, he says, go tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. What's being told here? You're being retold the story of Jesus through Peter. That, that, that Peter is experiencing the sufferings. He's experiencing the, the, the same things that happened to Jesus. Because as followers of Jesus, we will experience the same things. Peter is there. He's like that. He's struck in the side. It, when, he, when he shows up, they don't believe it's actually him. Isn't that great too? The church is praying for him to be released. He shows up and they don't believe he's there. You ever prayed like that? You believe something and God shows up and you go, can't, can't be, can't be. So anyway, the, the, once, once again, I want you to see here that these stories have a lot of stuff going on in the stories. Um, I'm not going to do Exodus 14 for time, um, but Exodus 14 basically is the story where <clears throat> the, the children of Israel are at the Red Sea. And what happens is, is the cloud comes behind the children of Israel and creates light. And then what happens is, is the spirit comes, uh, 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 ruach is the Hebrew word, means wind, breath, spirit, um, comes, and comes on the waters. The waters are divided and the dry land comes up. It's, it's a retelling of the creation story. Remember, there was the light and the, sp the spirit was hovering. There was the light and then the, the ground was 
come up out of the thing. We're, we're being retold a new creation story. By the way, just, just an aside, um, if, you read the, if you read Genesis chapter one, um, it says 10 times God said, 10 times. There's a reason why when God gives, it's actually in the Hebrew, it says it's the 10 words. It, when it's first said, it's the 10 commandments. God ordered the world with 10 words. He's having to reorder society with 10 more words at Sinai because he's creating a new community to go into the world and be his kingdom and priests. Of course, they didn't do that, but that's what he's doing. So there's all these stories inter intersect with one another and, and, and they continue to, to swirl. So pay attention to those things. My third thing is, is this word that you're probably not gonna know, but you'll learn a little bit more about it right now, is what we call a chiastic structure. So much of the Bible is written this way. Um, <clears throat> again, I don't have time to go through all of it, but uh, what I've done is I've laid out Matthew. <clears throat> Matthew has framed his gospel around seven mountains. The reason is because in the Old Testament, Moses went to the top of Sinai seven times. And remember, Matthew's rewriting the story of Moses. He's a greater than Moses. In fact, Deuteronomy <clears throat> told us that there would be a prophet greater than Moses. Jesus is that prophet. So Matthew has orchestrated these mountains in what we call an inverted V. A V's like this, it's an inverted V. And I've laid them out for you <clears throat> in your um, text. Let me show you how they work. So in Matthew 4 is the first mountain of Matthew. It corresponds to the seventh mountain. In Matthew. It's the way it works. You work up the ladder and come down the ladder so you can remember the story. So what happens in chapter four of Matthew? Chapter four, Jesus is taken up on a mountain by, not everybody at once, by the devil, okay? And he is told if he will fall down and worship the devil, the devil will give him all the kingdoms of the world. The corresponding mountain is the last mountain in Matthew 28 where Jesus takes the disciples up on the mountain and he says, all power in heaven and earth have been given to me. They correspond. The second mountain happens in chapter five through chapter seven, which is the Sermon on the Mount. And if you remember when you read this, Markarios is the Greek word, blessed, 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 blessed. Well, the corresponding mountain is Mount of Olives, chapter 23. And if you remember what he does there, he says, woe to you, 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 scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, woe to you. What he's doing is, is he's reenacting Moses when he took the children of Israel to Mount Gerizim and Ebal, where he did the blessings and the cursings. Then, mountain three with mountain five, mount, mountain in 14 of Matthew is the mountain that Jesus goes up in solitude by himself. And Matthew 17 is the Mount of Transfiguration where the Lord says they, everybody's gone. Remember, Elijah and Moses are there, the law and the prophets and they're removed because the law and the prophets were testifying about Jesus. And when they're removed, the Lord says, listen to my son. He's the only one they see by himself. So the corresponding mountains are the fact that it's about Jesus. Well, the central mountain of Matthew, which is also the center of the book, by the way, is in chapter 15. And in chapter 15, I wanna read this to you because this is just beautiful. It says, Jesus went, verse 29, Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee and he went up on the mountain and sat down. And great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet and he healed them. Remember, uh, the Lord told Moses, am I not the one that makes people seeing or blind? Am I not the one that makes them mute or talking? Hear, 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 hear the Lord who's saying in Exodus 3 these things that we go, why would he make somebody? Well, for, for some way, God has ordained the world where if we didn't have sickness, we wouldn't know him as healer. If there, if there weren't sin, we wouldn't know him as savior. If there weren't things, we wouldn't know who God was. 
So God has ordained the world in a way that's far beyond our pay grade, in a way for us to understand who he is. And so in Matthew 15, the God who creates some mute, some blind, some lame, is healing them. And they go to the top of the mountain, and it says, and he heals them. So the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel because the God of Israel was there on the mountain. And when Moses went up on the mountain, what happened? Nobody could come. But Jesus is the greater Moses who all the sick and afflicted came to and he healed every single one of them. These books are written that way. And you can go through, and then, and then even pericopes, passages of Scripture are written this way where, where, where they, that you, you can see chiastic writing. These are some things that you can go back and study. You can go on, you can Google, you can find this stuff. It's not hard to find, but it will help you understand how to read Scripture. Fourth, context. This is probably of all the things I can teach you right now, this is the easiest one to understand, and it's probably the one that's most needed because we quote a lot of Scripture and um, it's hard for me. My wife always says, it, she goes, it's really tough for you to sit in church, isn't it? I'm like, yeah, it is because I, 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 I try so hard not to listen sometimes because I'm going, this is not what the passage is saying at all. You know, and I'm like, God, just help them say whatever they need to say to bless the people because I know you work through all of us, you know, whatever. But, but, but there's a lot of scriptures you probably are quoting um, that, that I might mess up right now. Um, the good thing is, is I'm gone after tonight and you get Jason back and everything is good. Um, so, so you can just like go, that guy was crazy. But, but I wanna show you how, how this works. So like Philippians 4.13, let, let's, let's, let's flip there. One of these passages that everybody likes to quote. Um, I can do all things, man, through Christ who strengthens me. I see people like at the gym going, I'm, I'm gonna get this 300 pound weight because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens. That's really not what Paul's taught. He wasn't in a gym talking about that. <clears throat> what he's saying is, he says in, in verse 12, he says, I know how to be brought low. Actually, what he says is, he says in verse 11, he says, I'm not speaking of being in need for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Let, let, let me tell you something. If there's one thing the American church needs to learn how to do is to be content in whatever situation they find themselves. See, that's a testimony to God. The, the world understands if you don't like the situation you're in. They, they're the same way. Okay, but when you can walk in joy, no matter what's going on in your life, they want to know what's going on. Okay, and see, that's, and, and let me tell you something. Jesus never said, go blast people. He said, go into the town, heal the sick, and then tell them the kingdom of God has come near. We, we do it exact opposite. We go in, you're wrong, you're wrong, you don't do this right. And, it, and it, they go, oh, they didn't like what I said, must be persecution. No, you were just dumb. <laughs> so Philippians 4.13, he says, I've learned this secret. He goes, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of, placing, of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What he's saying is, is whatever situation I find myself in, whether good, bad, and different, what it is, I found the secret of contentment. And the secret of contentment is to find my life and my joy in Christ, not in my circumstances. Circumstantial Christianity has destroyed the American church because when life's going good, we love God, turn up the song, life is great. Then when life doesn't go good, where did God go? How come he's not... Man, that is just some really bad theology, folks. That is really bad. Like, terrible. Like, if you think you're gonna follow Jesus and it's always gonna be roses, let me, let me tell you something. That's not gonna happen. If you're gonna be conformed to the image of Christ, there's gonna be some people that lie about you, that do you wrong, that leave you on the night that you need them. That's what it's like to be conformed to the image of Christ. So it's not all roses. And in fact, when you're going through trials, what does James say? Count it joy. You go, what? Count it joy when I'm going through difficulties? Yeah, because James says, you know what God's doing? He's working in you to build in you the character that you need. We fall into temptations and problems and trials and situations. We go, oh man, where did God go? 
Well, what happened? How come, how come I lost my job? And how come, maybe you lost your job because you didn't need that job. Maybe you lost that job because you weren't working as hard as you should. Maybe you lost that job because you were talking about somebody. Maybe you lost that job for who knows what. Maybe we'll never even know. But I can tell you this, God is at work whether you're employed or not employed. He's always at work, okay? And he's always doing stuff in the life of the Christian. So Psalm 37, four, this is one that is just grossly taken and out of context. So get ready, because this is some of your all's favorite verses, and I'm just about to trample on them. I'm sorry, I love you. <clears throat> I'm only here for one night, so tip the waitresses. Um, anyway, so we, we hear the phrase, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You've heard that one, right? So if you just love God, love God, love God, he replaces your heart's desire with his heart's desire, and everything is great, and then his desires become your desires, and he gives you the desires of your heart. Okay, That's not what this is talking about at all, in any way, shape, or form. Start in verse one. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. You ever looked around the world and go, why in the world has God allowed this garbage to go on? You ever get mad? He says, don't worry about it. And don't be envious either. Don't get all incensed. And don't get envious. Well, I can't believe. Look at what's happening. They don't even believe God. They, 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 they just live however they want to live. And look at the house they have. And look, he said, don't, oh, no, 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 no. Don't get mad and don't get envious. He goes, they'll soon fade like the grass. And they'll wither like the green herb. God, God's got it under control. It may not look like it to you right now. He's not going to let injustice go on forever. He says, so your job is to trust in the Lord and just continue to do good. Don't look around at all the stuff that's going on. Stay in your lane. Stay focused. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Another way of saying that is delight yourself in the Lord. And what are the desires then? That you're, that you're, he, well, he goes on. He says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Act in what way? Well, what is he going to do? Well, he'll bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. That's a word for the church. We get angry and we want to bring wrath on everybody. That's God's job, not ours. Ours is to just trust God and continue to do good. He says, fret not yourself because it usually leads to evil for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. So, when we're told by David to delight ourselves in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart, what he's saying is, is if you and me will trust God, he will bring forth justice one day. Those desires that are in our heart to see justice, he will bring those things forward one day. Our job is to trust in him. See how context matters? matters. Let's look at another one here. Um, John 10, 10. You ever heard John 10, 10? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I hate to tell you this, but John 10, 10 has nothing to do with the devil. Sorry. I know you probably quoted that your whole life. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. I'm not saying the devil maybe wouldn't want to steal, kill, and destroy, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. Chapter 10, verse 1, he says, He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. He says there's only one way in. He uses the imagery of a sheepfold which has a gate that that can open up and close and you have to go in the gate and open through the gate. It's the only way in. He says if you go in any other way, if you try to dig under, go over, something else, can't do it. You're a thief and you're a robber. He says, but he who enters by the door of the shepherd is the, is of the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they're not going to follow, but they will flee from him. He says in verse 6, he says, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they didn't quite understand. So Jesus said, make it simple, I'm the door of the sheep. Period. You want to know how to get into heaven? I'm the door of the sheep. He says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. You can't get in any other way. But the sheep didn't listen to them. I'm the door. 
If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and find pasture. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. The thief in this passage is someone who's promising you eternal life other than through Jesus. Notice what's missing in this passage is the devil. He's not talked about at all. Jesus is talking about false prophets. Now you could say, well, the devil stands behind false prophets. Okay, that's something that you're interjecting into the text. The text is not saying that. The text is telling you that the only way into heaven is through the door and Jesus is the door. And if anybody tells you there's another way in, that person is a thief and a robber and they're stealing from you and they're keeping from you the truths of eternal life. That's why context matters. Revelation 3.20, one more. And then I'm gonna wrap it up here with a real quick last little thing and get you out of here because I think I'm a little, a little late here on time. Apologize. Revelation 3. So Jesus is talking to the church at Laodicea, which by the way is not a great church. But he says in verse 20, he says, I stand at the door. The, the, the door of what? Well, the door of the church. This one gets used like his, he stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. That's not what the text is talking about. It's talking about a church that thinks it's rich and increased with goods and has need of nothing, but really is wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He says, I'm standing at the church door and I'm knocking. Do you know how scary that is? To think that people could be in church having a service and the Lord is actually not even in the church. He's standing at the door knocking. He says, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. In other words, he wants to have fellowship with you and me. So he's saying, I'm knocking on the door of the church at Laodicea. And if you'll open it up, I will come in because what I really want is not a religious performance. I, I, I wanna have a relationship with, with you. The last thing I want to say is, is that scripture is ultimately about Jesus. Luke 24, I talked about that this morning. John 5, 39 and 40, um, we've talked about that. Genesis 22 is the story of Abraham. It happens on the third day with Isaac. Um, he thinks that Isaac is going to, he's going to go up on the mountain and he's supposed to take Isaac's life and it's interesting in the Hebrew, it says it's his one and his only son. There's so many things. He carries the wood up the mountain. Anybody else carry? I mean, all this, all this, all this stuff. He says, Daddy, where's the lamb? He goes, don't worry, God will provide. But remember, it's a ram. So you're still looking for the lamb. All these stories are so rich. Exodus 15, the story of the waters of Marah. There are three days. It says there are three days. Three days have happened. They're on the third day. They haven't had anything to drink. If you go without water for three days, it's not a good thing. But it's the third day. On the third day, they come to the waters of Marah. They're bitter. Can't drink it. What does it say? It says, the Lord pointed Moses to a tree. To a tree? What? And the, the Hebrew word yara is, well, we, is, is the root word of Torah, which is the Torah is an instruction, is a pointing. He's pointing Moses to a tree. He tells Moses, take the tree, put the tree in the waters. When he puts the tree in the waters that are bitter, they're turned sweet. Is there any other tree? that we know something that on the third day that turns bitter waters sweet. Yes, because the Old Testament is about Jesus. In Daniel 6, I'll end with this. I don't have time. I'd love to go through the text, but I want to get you guys out of here, and I know that Jason wants to go watch God's team play football, um, <clears throat> which is really not true because God's team is actually the University of Kentucky basketball, but uh, that's a whole other story because um, that's really God's team. But, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, the story of Daniel is, is beautiful. You, you have Daniel who is all the religious leaders are conspiring against Daniel. Does that sound familiar? So they come up with a scheme that they can get him. Day one. Day two, as he's prayed, they see him praying, and they've said if he prays to God, then he's a dead man. They go to the king, and the king's like, yeah, I've signed this thing. Yeah, he's... The king tries to do everything that he can to get Daniel out of actually dying. Daniel is placed in the lion's den, down. A rock 
is rolled over the entrance to the lion's den and it's sealed with the king's signet. On the morning of the third day, they run out, they remove the stone and they lift Daniel up out of the lion's den. See, all these stories are about Jesus. You just have to read them. You just have to see and be given permission that your Bible is really about Jesus. And he's the answer to our problems. And when we read it this way, we learn to love the Savior more. I hope that's helped. I hope you learned something. Um, and uh, I hope that was a blessing. I'd like to say a prayer for you, and then we'll I'll let Jason come up and finish out. Father, I humbly ask that you would take the inadequate and meager words of myself and somehow in between what I've said and the ears and the hearts of those that are here, you would, would speak life, would speak encouragement. I pray people would leave here wanting to read their Bible more. They would leave here wanting to study more. They would leave here wanting to do more things like this. I pray, Lord, that Access Church would not only be a place that grows and sees people come to faith and sees people baptized and sees people's lives changed, but I pray, Lord, here in Lakeland, you would also raise up an army of students, Lord, that really are dedicated to the study of your word so that we're not only wide, but we're also deep. And I pray, Lord, that that would be the case here. Bless Pastor Jason. Bless Pastor Liz. Bless their family. And Lord, I pray that you would do things here that one day people would write about in the history books. We love you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you, thank you. Come on, can we put our hands together and thank Dr. Chip Bennett, everybody. Uh,